What's going on guys? First RV here back with uh, part four of our first RV series with uh, daily duties and responsibilities, right? So this is not to uh, there's nothing to do with the common core competencies or anything like that. This is just basically our daily duties and responsibilities. Some of the areas we're gonna cover. Uh, we're gonna cover individual training, administration, enlisted promotions, uh, NCOPD, uh, counselings, reenlistment, retention, military schools, soldiers discipline, health and welfare, and then finally the senior enlisted advisor, what's your role with this, right? So uh, without further ado, let me go ahead and share my screen. But I do want to thank you guys for all your support that I've uh, you guys have given me so far in the series. If you're new to the channel, make sure you hit that like and subscribe button. All right, so first sergeant duties and responsibilities, right? Part four of the series. So these are some of the basic duties and responsibilities that we deal with on a daily. However, we all know that situations arise and different things we are faced to deal with daily. But this is a good starting point and a good list. So things we're going to cover in here, some individual training, administration, enlisted promotions, uh, NCOPDs, counselings, reenlistment, retention, military schools, soldiers discipline, uh, welfare, and or health and welfare, senior enlisted advisors to the commander. Right? So these are some of the topics that we are going to cover. However, as we get further into the series, a lot of these topics we're going to explore more in depth. All right. So I don't want to say that well, I don't want to call this an overview. But there's going to be a lot more material as we actually go through all these topics uh, in later portions of this series. So these are my final or my initial thoughts. Right? When I was thinking about doing this portion of the series, this is what came to mind for me. Right? First sergeant duties are endless. Right? He or she is usually the first one in the office and the last one to leave. So be prepared for that. There may be some late nights. All right? Uh, almost all the unit duties and operations begin with the first sergeant. So you pretty much have your hand in all day-to-day -day operations within your organization. We hold formations, we instruct the tomb sergeants, we advise the commander and all, all of the unit's capabilities and what, what we're doing. Uh, it must keep the entire unit motivated and ready at a moment's notice. Um, like I said before in my previous videos, first sergeant is the backbone of the unit, just as the NCO is the backbone of the army. All right? Yes, the company commander is in charge overall. However, the true chest of success is in, in the army is a good first sergeant at the helm. All right? He or she will make or break a unit. If they fail, the entire unit fails. One of the most important duties the first sergeant has is individual training and discipline and development of the NCOs. Uh, the first sergeant must be able to convey tasks and duties to platoon sergeants. You have to be able to communicate to the lower channels, right? His or her job can sometimes be an administrative nightmare, right? So, especially when you go to take over, I know every time I become a first sergeant put in this situation, it seems like the first 90 days I'm just digging myself out of a hole, right? So be prepared for that, but. In a later video, I'm actually going to give you some pointers on how to overcome some of this stuff. Um, we recommend promotions and disciplines to the commander. So keeping it simple, right? I'm going to keep it as simple as I can, I can get it. Company commanders typically fo focus on future operations to include mission planning and strategic work, where the first sergeant focuses on current operations and handling the day-to-day -day issues, right? The commander determines where the unit must go. The first sergeant must... Make sure the unit gets there on time and properly equipped to meet the commander's intent. Right, so just keep that in mind. So let's talk about individual training, right? So like I said, we're actually going to do a whole whole series on training. But whether you're a cook, communications uh, specialist, intelligence analyst, infantryman, mechanic, etc., you're a soldier first. Okay. In addition to being able to do your MOS-related duties, you must be able to shoot, move, and communicate, and survive on the battlefield. Right. That means soldiers must have the basic fundamental knowledge of tactics, fighting, and winning. Right? So, we're, this is a huge part. Every soldier serving in a combat uh, support, combat service role, and they end up fighting in combat. Just because you think you're not an infantryman or not a combat related MOS, think again. All right? uh, anyone can get uh, attacked by the enemy, they must know how to kill the enemy and survive. To do so, there's a handful of critical tasks every soldier must know how to do proficiency. So, Army identifies warrior tasks and battle drills, WTVDs, that enhance the soldier's readiness to fight on the battlefield, okay? 
Warrior tasks are a collection of individual soldier skills known to be critical to the soldier's survival. Examples include you know, weapons training, tactical communications, urban operations, first aid, things like that. Battle drills, right? Are groups designed to teach units to react and survive in combat situations. Examples react ambush, react to chemical attack, uh, evacuate injured personnel from the vehicle. So, all this stuff when you're planning your training, you're looking at your medals, you know, all your individual tasks, your collective tasks, and all this stuff, you need to make sure you're planning it correctly with your command. You need to sit down and figure out what you want to plan, what you want to train on, and how you want to train, and actually how to build up to that culminating event. Uh, increase the relevance of training to current combat requirements and enhance the rigor in training, right? The driving force behind the change comes from lessons learned, right? So all these things, there's a ton of information out there about lessons learned. Standards remain constant, but commanders must be aware that the enemy adapts at once and soldiers training will change sooner between the current operational environments. So as the enemy's changing, we're changing. Uh, I should start out by telling you that all the warming order tasks are important to me, all right? say one is more important than the other is hard to do. Uh, soldiers must know how to do all these tasks to be competent in combat. I'm going to take my best shot here at picking my top 10 tasks on this list. Like I said, you may agree or disagree. Hey, that's fine. But make sure you're developing what's important to you, what's important to your organization, what makes your makeup. So one for me is engaging targets with the M16 or M4, right? Without a doubt, I put this the most important because soldiers must know how to shoot their assigned weapon to kill the enemy, okay? We have to engage targets accurately and from numerous distances. We have to build in our training plan, you know, weapon maintenance, how to shoot weapon, PMI. We have, we're going to talk about all that later in the series, but this is extremely important. Number two, I got to conduct operations according to the law of war, right? I'm a big fan of the law of war. I know our enemies have done some shady illegal stuff, but we have a moral compass that we're guided by. We have to do what's right. All right? We have to act humanely, even in combat. Uh, standards and discipline are a must for all leaders and soldiers when we're talking about laws of war. Three to me is move under direct fire. Okay, Soldiers need to know what to do when the bullets start flying. Whether it's direct or indirect, soldiers must know how to keep themselves safe, defend their area of operations, and of course kill the enemy. The last thing you want to happen is have one of your soldiers either freeze when the bullets start flying, okay? Um, you must know how to get your team and yourself to safety. So this is extremely important to learn how to move. Forward to me, evaluate a casualty. When and or if your battle buddy gets shot or hurt in the battlefield, you must know how to properly evaluate them to determine that they're okay and need help from medics, right? So your T triple C, you know, all the stuff that we're changing for the CLS environment and uh, self-care and self-aid. We have to take that stuff seriously. You must be able to identify serious injuries from minor injuries. Perform uh, number five. Perform voice communications. Right. So everyone needs to know how to communicate on radio. If you're a leader or a, or a radio operator, get shot. Someone else must pick up the slack. Right. So you need to train on these things. Back to your basics. Right. You know how to call for higher headquarters. How to contact your subordinates. More importantly, you need to know how to turn the radio on and off, okay, change the battery, military, military alphabet, proper call signs, how to set up right frequency and make it operational, okay, these are all things that you can do, like on command maintenance things, how to integrate your maintenance and your radio maintenance and, and still train on your, your task here. Six to me, request medical back, every soldier needs to know how to call medical back, okay, anything can happen in combat. Even it, you know, it doesn't even have to be combat, okay? It could be a training exercise or a training event, right? Um, if you are the lone survivor, even if your buddy gets hurt, you must know how to get them to medical help. Seven, navigate while dismount, okay? Land navigation, I think that's one area in training that we are severely lacking. I don't know what it is, but I've seen a decline with uh, land navigation skills and map skills over the past few years. Every soldier needs to know how to navigate we dismount, right? We may not start out as a foot soldier, but anything can happen. So you need to go need to go from point A to point B. Learn how to use a compass. Talk about mills and orient a map, terrain features, all this stuff that you can build upon. And that's extremely important as a soldier. Navigate wild mounts, okay? So you need to know how to read a map and get to vehicle, troops, and equipment from one point to another, okay? So, like I said, just like the other one. 
Number nine, react to possible IEDs, improvised explosive device, okay? Ever since Iraq the war, IEDs become our way of life, right? We've got a lot of urban uh, tactics, and I think we, we're starting to move away from that, but we can't stop training on okay? Uh, every soldier must know what to do when they're under attack. They must know how to maneuver their vehicle and get into personnel equipment safety, okay? And, and a good way to build on this is your, your convoy operations, you know? Talk about the herringbone and how, how to protect yourself, how to pull security, how to do your 5, 15, 25 meter checks, all that stuff. You need to, you need to train on that. Lastly, 10, right? Develop professionally. So, I'm a big fan of personal and professional development. I believe every soldier should improve daily. I believe all soldiers should be students in their profession. They should attend uh, schools, learn everything they can about being a good soldier, leader, find mentors, read books, etc. One way to get after this is you assign, uh, uh, why well, I call it assigning LPDs, right? But every quarter, I take my soldiers and I take my NCOs and we go and have lunch or something, and we talk about a article that I assign them, and we talk about it. You know, what did you learn from this? How can we apply this? Right? So it's a it's a big thing, you know. You gotta you if you wanna be a good leader, you got you gotta stay in the books, you gotta read. So bottom line, right? Every soldier, regardless of your MOS, must have certain combat skills set to them they can survive. Army's created, I believe, is thirty nine warrior tasks, every soldier must be able to do in battle. Alright, so train on. As a small unit leader, you're responsible to ensure your soldiers are proficient in all these tasks so they can deploy, get the job done, and return home safe. I think that's our, our number one priority when we deploy is to bring everyone back. So let's talk about the administrative portion, alright? So this probably takes up 90% of our time, right? So don't think of yourself as a pencil pusher, right? The first sergeant works with the orderly room, training room, and company XO, and we make sure all administrative paperwork is done, done right, done on time, right? So <coughs> some things that this includes is your promotions, your awards, uh, reports, routine paperwork, etc. We're going to get more into this when we get into our administrative portion of the series, but everything that happens in that company, some sh way, shape, or form, you should have your, your hand in it or should be made aware of it. Uh, we don't necessarily do all the paperwork ourselves, but we're overseeing the supervised process, right? We're the, we're the, the muscle we need actually answers. We also update attendance rosters and things like that. Uh, some of the most common duties and responsibilities, and you know, keep in mind, you know, every unit is different, right? But get organized. These are some tips that I can give you for success when it's your company operations and you know, your, your areas. Get organized. It's one of these jobs where you must be organized. There's a lot of different suspenses, things to do, and people and things to manage. You need to have a good daily to-do list. So. One of the first things I do when I get in the office in the morning, I write my, my to-do list, right? And it's normally the first couple of things I check are evals in ESS, see if they have been signed, if they had to be signed. I check med pros, I check, check the HR metrics, all that stuff, right? Check appointments for the day, um, do any kind of uh, taskings or anything coming from the battalion or higher, any do-outs, operations, anything that's going on, right? Uh, time management, right? So this goes hand in hand with establishing priorities. You have to learn how to manage time, okay? This is one of these jobs that require long hours. There's so much to do. You need to be a good day uh, planner or a time management system you can follow so you can stay productive, right? So with the time management thing, you're going to have to make some decisions where you may be given 20 missions and you're going to have to prioritize them. Some missions you're just going to have to fail. You're going to have to drop, right? But you need to you need to get that done, right? Last thing is balanced relationships, right? This is without doubt the hardest part of your job. You have a chain of command telling you what to do daily basis. The real line should be your company commander. Like I said, the relationship between you and the company commander should be strong, should be solid. Most cases, you, uh, they're your rate or senior rate. You really work for them. You need to get guidance from other personnel on a daily basis, right? So you need to build the relationships. And another thing that comes along with that, is for success is relationships is your family relationships you have to give your family the time they need and deserve as well and you should give your soldiers and leaders the same amount of time that you would want with your family all right we're going to get into that uh, separately in a different series so let's talk about some of the list of promotions right so first sergeant oversees all the list of promotions in the unit right 
So they recommend uh, promotion potential up to E4 to the company commander. In addition, you ensure the NCOs know about promotion opportunities in the unit and outside the unit. Okay? Be sure you make them aware. They get input from their support NCOs about who is ready for the promotion and who isn't. When you get your monthly reports every month, don't be the one that you sit there and circle yes, 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 yes. If they're not ready for promotion, do not promote them. That's one of the problems we're having with NCO Corps right now. Right? We're promoting these people way too fast, all because they have to go to the board. They must go to the board. They're in their primary zone, right? But there's ways around that. So make sure that they're ready. Develop a program. Develop a, a promotions program in your unit where there's mock boards, there's questions throughout the day, there's some type of measuring your yardstick that you can see that these people are actually ready to get promoted. All right? You also teach their subordinates what they need to do if they want to get promoted, right? So educate them. Tell them, hey, you know, you got three months before your window. You know, you have no correspondence courses. Review the PPWs. Look at them. Just get, try to get some some range time for your, your soldiers going to the promotion boards and things like that. Help them out. So let's talk about NCODPs, right? So first start an overseas unit NCODP program, okay? You should always look for a creative way to teach and develop your, your support NCOs. You should brainstorm ideas, NCODPs, teach classes and oversee classes, right? So you don't have to teach every class. One thing that we fail to do is we, we fail to reach out to these outside organizations. There's so many organizations on your post, and I'm going to use Fort Carson for my example, to teach budgeting classes, teach management classes, uh, overcoming drugs and alcohol classes. There's all kinds of resources available to you that you can have them come in and actually give classes to your people right it also breaks up the monotony of hearing the first sergeant talk all the time okay so the main purpose of uh, army ncopd or dps right is to educate and develop army ncos for positions of greater responsibility that's our job to train the force so typically the program is managed by like i said the senior enlisted soldier and you know first sergeant with the battalion sergeant major right so <clears throat> this person is responsible for planning the program Assigning the instructor, choosing topics, making sure the classes are scheduled, executed, conducted, and assessed on time to standard. So you should publish an NCODP uh, schedule. You know, let your people know. Go 12, 18 months out so that they know this month we're going to learn this, right? So with that said, keep in mind, you know, pull your audience and see, hey, what, what are you guys struggling with? Or what do you want to learn? You'd be surprised some of the stuff that they want to learn. You would think that you know, it'd be basic stuff, but sometimes they actually want to learn some, they want to deep dive into some topics, right? So sometimes the training is in the classroom environment. In the case of units may conduct site visit or conduct training in the field. I'm a firm believer to get out of your AO, right? Go somewhere different to give your uh, NCODPs. Found the best classes are always in the field away from the company, whether it's sure or distraction, okay? For, for many units, NCODP is nothing but a training requirement. Sure, the training takes place, but it very seldomly goes above and beyond what is required. I have seen NCODPs checked as a big check the block attitude, right? Just, yep, let's train on sharp. Yep, check the block. Yep, we did ASAP. Yep, yeah, we, we changed. Yep, yep, suicide prevention. That's not what it's there for. It's there to develop the force. So treat it as that. Don't ever treat it as a check the block. And make sure you schedule this stuff on your DTMS training calendar. Now, on the other hand, some units have phenomenal NCODP, okay, where leaders are developing during the future. When I was in the uh, 68 CSSB, man, my sergeant major has some outstanding NCODPs. And I'll tell you what, if you ever go to an NCODP, you need a notebook, a piece of a pen, a paper, a pencil, something. You need to take notes. You're there to learn. You're there to, to bounce ideas off of each other, right? This happens because the person in charge takes pride and personal responsibility in the program. It goes the extra mile to ensure the training is well prepared. So if you're planning training, make it well worth it, okay? Don't waste your time, don't waste their time. So I've come up with seven great tips that I think they're well, I think they're great tips on how to plan uh, NCODPs, right? So number one, plan the training ahead of time. Don't wait till the last minute to schedule an NCOP. Don't come in on Monday and say, yep, let's fire this new NCOP. No. Don't do that. Publish it ahead of time. Put some serious thought into it. Give your instructors plenty of time to repair. The more time you give them to repair, the better. Whenever you wing it, the training won't go very well. And that's, that's to be honest. 
uh, determine what training your NCOs need, okay? If you're looking for ideas or topics, spend a few minutes and list the weaknesses of each year's subordinate NCOs. That's one thing I did. I have a little book. I have all my NCOs. In, and, you know, I, I constantly update their strengths. I constantly update their weaknesses and come up with some brainstorming ideas on how I can get them some more uh, more time in certain areas to actually develop some of these skills or who I can partner them up and partner partner them up with for someone that's strong in some of those areas okay you can also survey your NCOs get topics and ideas from them from them see what they want to learn three practice and rehearse right? rehearsal is the key just like everything you do in the army rehearse 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 you get in a class make sure you rehearse it practice it ahead of time it will go smooth all right role play with them if necessary make sure they have resources they need. you know take the training off site I found that when you stuff everyone in the classroom, they have their cell phones, it's easy to have distractions, okay? If people come in, interrupt the training, phones ring, doesn't go smoothly as well, right? Get away from your, your, your company, okay? Go somewhere different. <coughs> Another thing is assign different trainers, right? So everyone in the Army's got different points of views, different ideas, and different ways they would do things. Well, there's nothing there's nothing wrong with doing an SODP and doing that. You don't want the same person doing the training month after month, okay? Mix things up. Give everyone a chance to teach a class. This is developing their, their military briefing skills, their communication skills, learning what it's like to be under, uh, under distress, you know, when you're uncomfortable. Being a leader, you're not meant to be comfortable. You're going to be put in a lot of uncomfortable positions. Um, six, get maximum participation, okay? Make the training mandatory for all the students. Don't let your subordinates come up with reasons why they can't attend the training. If you let them do that, you'll have a lot of people come up with excuses and miss the training every time. Okay. Seven, like I said, schedule Army SOPD during non-productive time. Okay. You don't want to schedule in the middle through the day. Like for me, I'm I'm in an FSC, in a striker uh, battalion, so or a, a striker unit. So it's very hard. I have to get very creative on how I pull my mechanics. And, and, and so forth, right? So be smart about how you schedule. Look for opportunities in training calendar, okay? Do not interfere with main, major training events. Like I was telling you, there's countless, countless subjects you can uh, use for Army and CODPs. I uh, listed a few examples that can be used, uh, get you thinking. We have some sort, uh, sort of by category to make it a little easier, right? But like health and, and wellness, right? Lose weight, run faster, proper nutrition, how to max the ACLT, how to stay in shape after 30. Right? Weightlifting tips. Right? Career management. Talk about management tips. And so yes, and so yours. Uh, tips and mistakes to avoid. Additional duties. Managing your SRB. How to write awards. And so yours. How to show them how to map out their career. How to stay competitive. Leadership. Right? How to be a leader. Communication skills. Team building. Empowerment. Conflict. You know, these are all different ideas. Uh, personal finances. Right? Debt reduction strategies, your savings plan, how to buy a house, budget, operations, and we talk about maintenance operations, supply operations. Um, one thing I do is every quarter I, I, I schedule time where we go over certain chapters of all of our SOPs. That way they're constantly fresh in their memory of how we conduct business for the standards and discipline piece, right? And then, like I said, miscellaneous books review, movie reviews. Uh, a famous battle, case studies of successful leaders. These are all different ideas you can do. Uh, like I said, these are just ideas. If you got something better, please leave them in the comments below. I'd love to hear them. I'm always looking to grow myself. Uh, final advice, okay, when it comes to NCOPDs. It's not just a requirement. It's an effective way to train your subordinate NCOs for positions of increased responsibility. Remember, um, your, your key to success is to have someone in charge of a program that takes pride in what they do proactive, develop a solid plan, they need to remember three things, schedule, ex uh, execute, and assess the program in your unit. So let's talk about counseling, okay, so we're briefly going to hit on counseling since we have a huge counseling series we're going to do, but the first sergeant invests a lot of their personal time in counseling and mentoring the two sergeants and other NCOs in the unit, okay, they spearhead the unit's counseling program to make sure all units receive counseling as they need and deserve, it's the soldier's right to be counseled monthly. Right. One thing that I do, I know I'm getting a little off topic here, but when it comes to counseling NCOs that I rate or so forth, I don't like to do quarterly counselings. To me, it is hard for me to remember what I did two weeks ago 
then remember what I did for a full court. So what I like to do is I like to do three monthly counselings with that individual. I roll it up into the quarterly, and then that's how we take uh, our goal about that, okay? To be effective counselors, it must be a shared effort, all right? We need to assist, uh, assist subordinates in identifying strengths, weaknesses, creating plans of actions. Once an individual development plan is agreed upon, leaders support their soldiers throughout the implementation and continue the assessment. One thing we do is we are really good at counseling soldiers for when they screw up, right? But we fail them by not counseling them and telling them how great of a job they're doing. Not all counselors are negative, all right? Sometimes it's over, that's all they need to boost their morale. So call in the office, hey, let me give you a counselor, you know? Hey, on this date, X, Y, Z, you were outstanding. You completed this service. You completed this mission, this task. You know, you went above and beyond. Sometimes that's all they, they want to know that their chain of command is watching what they do and their accomplishments and what they're contributing to the team. So remember that. All right. Um, regular counseling provides leaders the opportunity to demonstrate uh, genuine interest in subordinates, help subordinates understand their roles, acknowledge and reinforce work and dedication, evaluate potential, right? So we promote potential, right? Uh, provide subordinates, empower subordinates, identify issues before they come significant problems, right? So we're going to cover a lot more when it comes to counseling when we actually do our series of counseling. But counseling is extremely important. If you don't have a company level counseling SOP on how counseling are supposed to be conducted and what's required, let me know. I'll get you a copy of my SOP. I'm a huge fan of making sure counseling are conducted. So let's talk about reenlistment and retention, right? So two of the most significant first arm duties are reenlistment and retention. So your job is to track enlistments and know when their soldiers need to reenlist or leave the army. So I hate to say that, and I know the army's downsizing right now, or not downsizing, but having a hard time meeting retention numbers. But I'll tell you what, there's some soldiers that just do not need to stay in the army. Okay? So you're looking out for the army's interest and looking out for their interest. So keep that in mind. And there's many ways you can tackle this. We're going to do a whole series on bars, but bars is a first sergeant and commander's best friend. Bars are outstanding because you can bar anywhere practically for anything. However, the nice thing about a bar is that you're giving the soldier the tools and telling them exactly what they need to do to overcome that bar. So that's going to that's going to help grow the soldier for one. It's going to help them overcome their deficiencies or wherever they're lacking, but it's also going to show you the drive that they actually have. If they really want to be retained, or they really want to further the military career, you, you'll see it in evidence when it comes to review the bars, okay? So, as a first sergeant, you got to be involved in every soldier's career path, okay? You need to, you need to look at that. Look at their CMF field and say, okay, here's an 88 mic, you know, this is your career map. As a, as a E3 through E4, you're supposed to do this, this, this. These are some additional duties you should have. These are some of your broadening assignments. This is generating the force assignments. Help them with that, okay? First arm will help uh, prepare soldiers and units for schools and specialty training. So train your soldiers. One thing I like to do in my unit, any unit I've barely been to, but I try to send one of my, one to two of my NCOs every month to a school. So I'm constantly training the force building more knowledge, building a database, allowing me to fulfill my requirements for the additional duties, but also holding them accountable for those additional duties once they're assigned, okay? So we have to train the force. First arms, we also create an environment where soldiers want to reenlist and continue the military service. Write that one down and remember. So if you come to work all, all the time pissed off, I hate this place, I hate the army, this sucks, it's going to feed off and your retention numbers are going to go garbage. Just remember that. Talking about military schools, first sergeant knows which soldiers need schools and they need uh, need help. Soldiers get enrolled, okay? This ensures your soldiers are more qualified. This gives them additional schools for career advancement. This also includes promoting college and technical trades to make them more well-rounded, okay? So prepare them for the next rank and more responsibility. <coughs> Talk about soldier discipline. 
First Star is the tip of spear when it comes to soldier discipline, okay? They work with the platoon star to handle 99% of the soldier issues that don't need to go to the company commander involved. Now when I say that, I have a good relationship with my company commander, so everything I know, he knows. But a lot of stuff doesn't need to make, make it to his level, right? We can solve stuff at the lowest level. We've always been trained to solve it at the lowest level, right? So if the issue is serious, they make recommendations to the company commander, UCMJ, or punishment, punishments, right? Some sign the, uh, the first sergeant, you're going to discipline a soldier on the spot. There's nothing wrong with it, right? This is hard for some parties for some reasons, but you have to look at it this way. Each soldier in the unit is a direct reflection of the unit itself, okay? So if you show me your squared away, PT excelling, weapons expert, I'm going to bet that all came from a higher standard set by a greater person, right? So you can tell what soldiers have had great leadership and what soldiers have had uh, mediocre leadership, right? First Sergeant is responsible for all, for overall wealth and welfare of each soldier in the unit. They do whatever they can to help their troops, and that includes their families. Lastly, health, health and welfare, right? So the First Sergeant monitors the health and welfare of the troops. They know about your soldier's family life, their personal problems, their living conditions. They do whatever they can to help. So this includes the barracks and other housing related issues, right? Make sure, make sure you're checking on them, doing your health and welfare inspections, walking through the barracks, checking the military housing, right? So I know there's a bunch of rules and regulations for checking military housing. Get with your post, get with what what they require. For us, like a 72 hour notice, like, hey, I'm gonna just come by and, and see your house. But hopefully, you have that relationship with your NCOs where if you show up, you're, you're welcomed. Anything that could affect a soldier and or their family should be made, or you should be made aware. So keep that in mind. So this is the last portion, right? We're going to get more into this when we talk about the uh, command team's relationship series. But the first star is the advocate for soldiers, and they also serve as the senior listen advisor to the company commander. Okay? What this means is the first star keeps the company commander informed about all soldier issues, and they keep the company commander grounded for making dumb decisions that negatively affect the soldier in the unit. Your job your task is to guide that company commander, provide him sound guidance, don't steer him in the wrong direction, always have the welfare of the soldiers and him as your priority, okay, we need to make sure we do that. A lot of uh, company command teams fail because we fail to do this with the company commander. We do not have a relationship, we think, you know, he's just an officer, he doesn't need to know this. That's not the, you guys are one team, one fight, so keep that in mind. This is the first or second most important job of preparing the troops for combat, like I said. So, like I said, these are just some basic uh, duties and responsibilities of stuff that uh, we do on a daily basis. So, I really hope you guys are enjoying this series. I um, hope you all stay tuned for the next part of the series when we talk about the NCO competencies and, and the uh, first sergeant and master sergeant. But as always, make sure you hit that like and subscribe button and go ordinary.